I am Robert Sudlock. I am with Natoli Scientific. Um, Natoli Scientific is a division of Natoli Engineering Company. And we've been working with uh, Regaku on their new uh, technology with X-Ray. And uh, we have some results on some studies that we've done. But I'd like to take this opportunity just to let everyone aware of who Natoli Engineering, Natoli Scientific is, and some of the work that we do some of the challenges that we see in tablet manufacturing, because that is our topic here. Um, so just to give you a background on Natoli before we jump into this, the Natoli Engineering Company has been established almost 50 years ago by the late Carmelo Natoli, um, now being run and led by our president and CEO, Dale Natoli. Uh, Natoli Engineering is located in St. Charles, Missouri. Um, again, over almost 50 years of service where we manufacture punches and dyes for tablet presses for all different industries, the pharmaceutical, the nutraceutical, dietary, um, the military, um, automobile tablets. Uh, there, there's many different industries that compress powder to make tablets, and Natoli is involved in all those, and we serve and we support our customers globally. Um, Natoli also offers tablet presses from single station tablet presses to compaction simulators, to R&D rotary, to pilot scale, manufacturing scale. So we have a whole line of tablet presses, all with the AIM data acquisition system. Uh, we measure compression forces, pre-compression, ejection. Our simulators look at displacement to look at work curves, heckle plots, material deformation properties. Um, so Natoli Engineering also offers spare parts for all industry tablet presses uh, and accessories. We also offer uh, encapsulators, so capsule machines. That's something new with the, uh, the company. We have service centers uh, around the globe to support our customers. Uh, we have technical centers and scientific centers. I'm uh, with Natoli Scientific, where we provide scientific uh, research and support for our customers that are developing powdered formulations. We also uh, collaborate with many universities worldwide. Uh, Dr. Hawari's on there. We work with Long Island University, the Arnold Marie Schwartz uh, School of Pharmacy in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we work with other universities as well. Uh, LIU is one of the ones we work very closely with. So let me get this going. Okay, so we have a, a large global presence here at Natoli. Uh, you'll see from this slide here all the distributors, representatives, technical centers, and partnerships. And you'll see Natoli headquarters is in St. Charles, Missouri, um, where we manufacture our tools, dyes, uh, tablet presses. Uh, we also have facilities in Idaho for encapsulators. Uh, but this gives you an idea of uh, an overview of all the areas that we support here at Natoli. This is our brick and mortar locations, kind of give you a, an image of what our facilities look like. So on the top left, that's our headquarters. That's three of our buildings out of the five on our campus. Uh, these buildings actually uh, manufacture our punches and dies, our tablet presses, and we have a training center here as well. Uh, the Pennsylvania site is where I'm located in the Tully Scientific. This is in Telford, Pennsylvania. And uh, this is where we have an R&D facility to help our customers. And then we also have uh, service centers in California, New York, and Poland. Uh, these service centers are designed to support our customers in that local territory. So for spare parts and quick support, uh, we could be there at a very fast notice because we are located in your area. So we have these facilities as well. Now, the Tully Scientific is where I work, and this is where we're going to focus on some of the research we've been working on and how we collaborated with uh, Regaku and their technology as well. So here at Natoli Scientific, we're over 14,000 square feet. Uh, it's a solid dosage lab and training facility. Uh, you can see some images of our classroom area and one of our labs here that's got some of our equipment. Uh, we work closely with lots of universities as well. Uh, one thing I want to mention in the near future, you're going to hear about some uh, Natoli labs being built over in India, uh, over in Pakistan. So we are establishing more international uh, university collaboration. So look out for that. You'll see that soon. Okay, so the lab capabilities here at Natoli Scientific. Um, so in Natoli Engineering, we support tooling and presses, but here at Scientific, we work closely with the powder formulations. Uh, so if our customers are having problem with flow or um, scalability, they're having issues with capping and, and uh, robustness, um, the things that we look at, for example, micromoretics, that's the 
the, the starting point of formulating a, a tablet is you have to focus on the powder, the particle size distribution, the flow characteristics, um, moisture content. All these things are very critical to have successful tableting all the way to high speed manufacturing. So if you don't have a good grip on the micromoretics, uh, this is going to cause issues downstream. So that's something we like to focus on. Uh, we also have blending capabilities from R&D two quart up to 20 cubic feet. We also do granulation work here. And one of the things I'm going to talk about are three major processes for developing a tablet. That'd be direct compression, where you just blend your materials. Obviously, there's a process with sieving and order of operation and the blending time. Um, so uh, blending, uh, granulation, uh, direct compression, roller compaction, high shear and fluid bed. So if your product doesn't flow well and you're having maybe some bulk density issues uh, or even compressibility issues, uh, granulation is a, another method uh, to get your tablet uh, to manufacturing with uh, the least amount of issues. Uh, so roller compaction, high shear fluid bed. And then tableting is our main focus here. We have compaction emulators and simulators, uh, single station hand presses with instrumentation, uh, rotary presses from R&D up to manufacturing. Film coating capabilities we have here as well. Uh, and we have milling from Freewit, a hammer mill oscillating and conical mills. And we offer analytical services for our customers as well. So that's kind of an overview and a totally scientific in our capabilities. And the main topic here is the challenges in tablet manufacturing. And with working with uh, Rigaku, we, we've, uh, we, we have some interesting data that I wanna share with you. But what are the common challenges in manufacturing? I've listed it here as well. Powder flowability. If your product doesn't flow well, it's not going to fill into the die cavity properly and your weights will be off. And when your weights are off, your API uh, drug load uh, content uniformity is an issue um, and all the other issues happen. When you don't have good flow, you're going to have robustness issues. You're going to have sticking issues, capping issues, everything under the sun when it comes to tablet manufacturing issues. So the first objective is you got to get this product to flow properly into the die cavity going from a hopper to a feeder to the die cavity. Uh, another common issue is the tabletability of the, uh, of the product. Uh, you must have some strength to this product so it will withstand uh, shipping and handling and friability. So we're gonna look at something called tabletability profile and we're gonna focus on that. We're also gonna focus on the strain rate sensitivity which is another common issue with tablet manufacturing. You may develop a robust formula at R&D stage but when you scale this into high speed manufacturing and these turrets go from, you know, 150 millimeters up to 400 millimeter pit circle, the velocities and dwell times are much faster at manufacturing. So your material might be sensitive to the rate at which you compress that powder and form a tablet. In R&D, they're compressing at very slow rates, very high dwell times, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In manufacturing, you're running at very high rates and very low dwell time. So if your product is strain rate sensitive, it may not survive high speed manufacturing. So that's another common issue that we're going to address in this uh, presentation today. Uh, some other common issues and challenges are dissolution and content uniformity, picking and sticking to your punch faces. And I've got some uh, examples of punches here. So when you've got product sticking to the face here, that's called uh, sticking. And when you've got logos and you get powder stuck between the crevices of your logo, it's called picking. That's a very common issue in manufacturing. And then the last one I identified is stability. We're going to focus mainly on the tabletability and strain rate sensitivity and how we relate this to uh, Rigaku and the collaboration we have going on. So before we go into that, I want to explain to you the compression process. Once you understand this process, it's the same for R&D rotary, pilot scale rotary, and manufacturing rotary. It follows all these steps. So let me identify these steps and uh, some of the issues that you will find. So this here is your turret where your upper punches are installed, your lower punches, and your dies. And actually, before I go into that, I have something here I want to show you. This is a pill maker. We are not making pills, we are making tablets. So I just want to identify that, that pills are actually, is rolled out like a dough and it's put on this, uh, this machine here and this mates with it. And basically you roll this back and forth and it makes a ball out of the dosage form. That's pill making. We are actually making tablets. So I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. So in the tableting process, again, you've got your upper punches installed, 
you have your dies installed. And this is an example of your die, an upper punch, and a lower punch here. So the upper punch has a short tip straight. The lower punch has a long tip straight. The reason for this is when you install your punches, your lower punch gets inserted into the die cavity. And throughout this whole process, I'm going to show you, the lower punch never comes out of the die. It, go, it moves up and down for filling the die, compression, ejection, comes back down to fill the die and repeats the process. One other thing to know here is the clearance between the lower punch tip and the die is, is a tight clearance. It's about 25 micron. So when it pulls down, it creates a partial vacuum to suck the material from the feeder into the die cavity. Where the upper punch has got a short tip length because it enters the die for compression and it comes out to fill the die throughout this process. Comes in to compress, comes out to fill and eject. And the clearance on here is more. It's about 45 micron. So when you compress this powder or granulation in your die, the air has to escape when you compress. And the way the punches and dies are designed is that the air is going to come out of the upper punch tip. That's important. So if the air is moving upward and the tablet wants to expand upward, this is where we have some robustness issues that I'm going to identify here in a little bit. Uh, so again, these are examples of upper punch, lower punch, and die, which gets installed onto your turret. And the very first step here is your die filling. This lower punch is going to pull down from a fill cam, and that partial vacuum that I showed you here is going to suck the material into the die. Now, one common issue is there's a lot of old press designs that the fill cam is actually located before the feeder, so it's pulling down air. And then hopefully the product has good flow and it falls into the die cavity. But a, a current design and the improved design is the lower punch tip should be pulling down when there's product above it from the feeder. So it takes advantage of that partial vacuum that I showed you. So as it pulls down, it creates that vacuum and pulls powder in. So you overfill your die with this stage. After you overfill the die, the dosing can pushes out the excess and scrapes it off with a scraper bar. So it's a two-step process. You overfill your die, you push out the excess, and you scrape it off. Well, you got to make sure that your tooling's in, in good shape, good tolerance, get that partial vacuum, and that your fill cam is located underneath your paddle feeder where there's product coming in when it pulls down. That's a very important um, part of the design of the press, and it's a common issue out there. So if your tablet press says it can run at 100 RPM, but you can't make product past 30 RPM, that might be the issue right here. So the next step is you've got two compression stages. You have a pre-compression that tamps the air out, consolidates the particles. And then you have your main compression. We're actually going to deform the particles to make a tablet and cause bonding. The pre-compression is only there to consolidate the product. And as the particles come closer in contact and the contact surface area is increasing, that favors higher compaction and robustness. So that's the purpose of pre. One common manufacturing issue that we find here is putting too much pre-compression force when the particles are deforming on the pre-compression. That's too much force. If you're forming bonding at pre-compression and hit it again under main compression, you're going to destroy the microstructure. This is where you get lamination issues and capping issues. This is one example. There's many reasons for capping and lamination. Uh, so that's the pre-compression. And then you have the main compression. This is actually where we want to deform the particles causing permanent deformation or fracturing and bonding of the particles. That's the main compression. After the main compression, you've got the decompression. Now, I, I kind of said this earlier, but when the punch is actually compressed, I said the air escapes out of the upper punch. Also, after you compress that tablet, the first thing that's re released is the upper punch. So the tablet still has a force on the lower punch and against the die wall, but it's released on the upper. So the tablet wants to immediately expand upward because that's where you release the load. So in the decompression area, that's what's going on. The upper punch is releasing that load from the upper surface of the tablet. The tablet wants to expand upward. This is where you get a lot of capping lamination issues. Finally, you've got the ejection and you have a takeoff tablet removal. Those are two separate stages. It's confused as one. So to eject a tablet, you have to push the tablet out of the die. You have to overcome the residual radial die wall force and the friction between the compact and die wall. So if you're having high ejection forces, that's gonna cause striations on the side of your belly band of your tablet. It will cause premature wear to your punches and cams in the press. 
So that's why we add a powder lubricant like magnesium steric or steric acid prove. Um, the only reason why we add that is to satisfy the ejection force. But you don't want to put too much lubricant in because that will impact the bonding process of the particles and also impacts the disintegration dissolu dissolution profile. So you want to optimize how much lubricant. And by measuring the ejection force, you can run these profiles and uh, you can optimize that level. After you eject the tablet, now the tablet's sitting pretty on the lower punch face and you have to remove it on a, off a takeoff bar. So there's a mechanical force pushing that tablet off the lower punch face. If you have any sticking or picking, this is where you'll notice it, right at the takeoff. If you've got an issue with sticking, there are many solutions. Uh, this is an example of Natoli's uh, zirconium nitride. We've got chromium nitride, ultra coat. Uh, M340, we've got lots of different steel types and coatings to uh, to fix the, the sticking issue. But in R&D, you should try to develop your formula so you know if there's going to be sticking issues um, and prevent these issues before you get into high-speed manufacturing. So this is the process. Again, it's the dye filling, overfill, dosing. Then you got pre-compression, a main compression, ejection, and takeoff. Those stages are the same no matter what scale tablet press you have. There is one machine out there called the Ema Caprima. It follows a little different principle, but every other tablet press follows this principle here. So if you can identify all these stages on the press, you can find out where your issue is. Okay. We focus a lot of time on that compaction event. So we're trying to match the, the consolidation time, the dwell time, and decompression in R&D and manufacturing. So what you get in R&D is representable of manufacturing scale. So we focus a lot on this. And with the Gaku and the data I'm going to show you, there's some uh, interesting data that can help us uh, and relate us to the mechanical properties of the tablet. So just to identify what compa one compaction event looks like, when you start putting a load on that powder, the consolidation time is from about 10% of peak. In this case, it's saying to peak. Some programs will actually use 90% of peak. The consolidation time is really when the particles are moving together, packing closely and getting the air. The dwell time is a time under maximum compression where you're holding the maximum force. And it's a function of this head flap and the velocity of a turret. So the larger your head flap, the longer the dwell time. The faster the turret, the shorter dwell time. So there are techniques of changing the head flap design, the length and diameter, to, uh, to try to match dwell times of high-speed manufacturing. Um, but again, here's the event. You got consolidation. You got the dwell. And then when you release the load, you have the relaxation time. Sometimes you'll hear decompression time or fall time. That's the compaction event. And if you can measure the punch displacement real time and correct for the machine compliance. So when you compress powder with your punches, you put a load on. The machine frame wants to stretch and the compression assembly. You have to correct for all of the uh, deformation of the machine so your data is corrected uh, for looking at in-die thickness real time. Now, here's some examples of measuring the, uh, the, the material deformation properties using a compaction simulator or an emulator. Again, we focus a lot of time trying to, uh, uh, to analyze and characterize the deformation properties so we have successful scale-up in a robust tablet. So this is just an example of a heckle plot where it's really just the, uh, the log of the porosity is a function of the applied pressure. So making one single tablet, we're measuring the pressure applied and we're measuring the, the porosity as well. And doing this analysis, which we've done some work with Long Island University and graduate students, um, we can look at the plasticity. Well, the plasticity is, is the YPPL. This will tell you, you know, how much pressure you need to apply to get the particles to start bonding and have plastic deformation. This is MCASEL. This is a, a microcrystal cellulose. It's a very common diluent or excipient in tablet uh, uh, development. And it's got a, a very good plastic number here. So 98 megapascals is relatively low. So you put that amount of pressure on, you're going to start bonding and create a robust tablet. We also analyze the decompression area, and we look at the, uh, the elasticity. That's the YPEL. Um, in this case, the, uh, the lower the number, the more um, elastic it is. So the microcrystal cellulose has good plastic deformation and has some elasticity. If you look at starch 1500, uh, it takes more pressure to get that plastic deformation, but it's got a, a lot of elastic recovery to it. 
So materials that have a lot of elastic recovery may require more dwell time, uh, added pre-compression, maybe a slower velocity to have more consolidation time. Um, so these are ways of uh, evaluating material deformation properties. Mannitol and compress, both of these fall in that brittle fracture uh, deformation properties, meaning that when the particles come together and they start to form and they actually fracture into smaller pieces, uh, and that could help you with better bonding, especially when you're using powdered lubricant to coat the particles. So then when you compress and you expose new clean surfaces, you get better bonding of a brittle fracture material. But all these different classes here are typically in one formula. And understanding this helps the R&D scientists formulate a robust product that is successful in manufacturing. So again, we focus a lot of time on, on robustness of a tablet from R&D into manufacturing. And this is a little case study, and this is where I'm going to show some of the x-ray results. We, we ran um, uh, APAP, which is acetaminophen uh, formulation, 20% uh, drug load, and we use uh, fillers like microcrystal cellulose, and we use magnesium stearate as a lubricant. Um, and we're comparing a direct compression blend versus a roller compacted blend versus wet granulation. Again, a direct compression is the least expensive way of developing a tablet. What you're doing is you're taking all your materials, your API, your diluents, disintegrants, lubricants, maybe flow agents, maybe flavor, color, and you blend them all together and you compress them. Okay, it's not that simple, but it's it's a it's a a more simple process compared to the other two. The roller compacted process is what we're doing is if we don't have good flow or we don't have a good bulk density, we're actually going to put our material through a roller compactor where there's two counter-rotating rolls that compress the material to make a dense ribbon. We take that ribbon to our mill, we mill it, we sieve it, and we end up with a larger particle, uh, a higher density, a, a bulk density, so it's gonna help the product flow better. Um, that's roller compaction. Wet granulation is we put our materials in a, in a bowl and we have an impeller that will mix the material and we introduce some type of liquid or a solvent uh, and a binder, and then you have a chopper on the side, and what that does is it, it agglomerates the material, then you have to dry it, and you can mill and sieve, and you end up with a more dense particle, uh, much more free-flowing uh, formula, and in some cases, it can help you with the compressibility. The roller compaction, on the other hand, you're introducing a force and energy into that product to make the ribbon, so you might lose compressibility when you get to the tablet press, and this is a great example here where you can see we're looking at tabletability profile as the tensile strength of your tablet as a function of the compaction pressure that we applied. So we ran our RD30 rotary R&D press at multiple points at these different pressure points, and we collected a sample of tablets to measure the thickness, the weight, the hardness or breaking force. We convert to tensile strength. Now, the reason why you're looking at tensile strength versus pressure instead of hardness in KP, which is a kilopon or newtons um, versus uh, kilonewtons on the bottom axis, is we normalize for the tablet geometry and the cross-sectional area of the uh, tooling. Why? Because if we're compressing in force, and let's, for example, I say I'm compressing at 100 kilonewtons of force, you might think that's a very high force. But if it's a large tablet with a large area, that force isn't that high. Uh, but if we look at the pressure, I know 50 megapascals to 300 megapascals is the normal range for most powders. Uh, most pharma is between 100, 200 megapascal. You get into the vitamins and Nutra, they're typically above 200. You get into other industries like catalysts and batteries, you're above 300. So if you take the force divided by the area, you can look at pressure. Now it doesn't matter what size my tablet is, something you know like three feet in diameter versus a regular 10 millimeter round. Uh, you use pressure, you can compare these different size tablets. So we ran at roughly 50 megapascals, about three, and we target a tablet tensile strength of two. 1.7 megapascals is what you'll find in literature, um, but two is a good target here. And you'll see to achieve two megapascal tensile, the direct compression blend and the wet granulated blend only requires about 70, 80 megapascals of pressure. That's very good because that's a low pressure. Um, where the roller compacted blend required much more pressure to achieve that 2 megapascal tensile, uh, almost double, about 140 megapascal, but it's still a very reasonable pressure uh, for compressing powders. Now, what happens when we look at an increased drug load of 40% and 60%? Well, 40% follow a similar trend, 
But now you'll notice to achieve two megapascal, you need a lot more pressure. We're above 140 megapascals to achieve that two megapascal tensile. Where the roller compacted requires, you know, about 270 megapascals. So a significant increase in the applied pressure required to achieve that robustness for roller compaction. What happened with the 60% drug load? Well, the direct compression blend didn't flow well enough to make consistent tablets. We made some tablets that were consistent, but the majority of them were, were um, you know, way out, ten, more than 10% weight control. So you'll see we couldn't even collect that data. The roller compacted blend still making tablets, but were very weak compared to that two megapascal. And the wet granulation blend was the winner. We didn't hit that two megapascal, but it definitely gives us more robustness than the roller compacted uh, process and the direct compression process. So we concluded this little study that 60% APAP loading with uh, wet granulation was the winner here. But now let's look at strain rate sensitivity. Well, as we increase our speed, uh, speed of a turret, we're increasing the velocity. This is another normalization. I wouldn't run my R&D press at 50 RPM and then say run my manufacturing press at 50 RPM. They're, they're not normalized. But if you speak in terms of tangential velocity or dwell time, now you can compare different size turrets and normalize. Well, you'll see for a 20% drug load, all of them are dropping slightly. Not a significant drop though. Here's two megapascal at the high speed at 100 1,000 millimeters per second, we're down to about, I don't know, 1.7 megapascal. So R&D is, you know, somewhere in 200 to 600 millimeters per second. Manufacturing is in that 1,000 and greater. So at 20% drug load, I'm going to feel comfortable about scaling up because I'm still making a robust tablet. 40%, we're dropping more. 60%, we're dropping even more. So the added drug load of acetaminophen is making the formula more strain rate sensitive. Now, how do we tie this in uh, with Regaku and their technology? So uh, we use the uh, CT lab and the Nano 3DX, and they're able to do a little bit of analysis for us. And we gave them a sample of the direct compression blend, 60%, which, again, in, we had too much weight variability. We couldn't even collect the data. Where the roller compacted at 60%, we have that data. Wet granulate at 60%, we, we all uh, concluded from that little study that that was the winner. And then we had direct compression at 40%. Uh, and you see here the two systems that were used, a CT Lab HX and a Nano 3D X. Okay. So here's just uh, a parent's uh, um, image that they provided, Regaku. Thank you for this. This is interesting. Everything looks smooth except for this DC at 60%. It's very rough. And you see some chipping here. And again, that DC grade um, formula at 60%. We, we had too many issues. So you can see the appearance here is showing, uh, you know, quality issue as well. Uh, these images here look pretty good. Now we look at a cross section with the x-ray. This is what was very interesting. So take a look at DC grade 60. We don't see much cracks in here. This looks pretty uniform. Um, so that was interesting. The second one here, roller compact at 60%. You're seeing a lot of cracks in here. Um, and this is very interesting that we're seeing these cracks because the cracks are going to lead to robustness issues. It's going to lead to capping and hardness issues. Now, take a look at the wet granulation blend at 60%. We've got a significant crack here, right where the belly band meets the, uh, the concavity area of the tablet. Um, this is a significant crack here. The 40% DC, we've got something in here. Uh, so this is very valuable for us to visually see because we can't see this uh, with the studies that we're doing. So to relate this with the robustness studies that we're doing is very valuable. Now we're going to zoom in here on the APAP formula, wet granulation blend at 60%. We're zooming in on these cracks. We've got about almost 66 um, micron of cracks here. This is, this is pretty significant. This is something we did not really see in R&D. But when we scale this into manufacturing, these cracks are probably going to lead to issues like capping, lamination. And when you have that issue it could lead into friability issues. So in a friabulator, you've got a sample of tablets that you weigh first and you tumble them. And as they tumble, we're measuring the wear and erosion to simulate shipping and handling. Something with significant cracks like this, the tablet might actually fail in the friabulator and, and split apart in something we call capping or lamination. Uh, we didn't see this R&D level, but this here, I would be nervous about scaling this into manufacturing by seeing these cracks. So this is an early sign right away 
uh, by making this one tablet that we've got some robustness issues going on here. Okay, let me speed along here. Here's another way of uh, viewing that image. Here's the original image. And here's a segmentation. We're looking at the solids and voids. This clearly outlines the cracks that we're seeing in that tablet. Another way of uh, viewing this here, here's that 6% wet granulated blend, that crack there, and then you, the cracks are shown in this red as well. So these are all different ways of looking at the, uh, the robustness and the mechanical failures inside the tablet that we can't see uh, normally when we're doing our studies. Uh, so as a quick summary here, um, these were the four different samples that we had sent. And sample three is what caught our eye. It's like, wow, this is the one we thought was the winner. But these significant cracks here that we couldn't see, this is something to look further into. If we take this product and go to high-speed manufacturing, um, it, it looks like we're going to have some issues. And like I said, with these issues here, capping um, can happen on the tablet press or in a hardness tester or high-speed manufacturing based off these cracks. That causes an issue. The product is, you know, it, it needs to be redeveloped or you need to change tooling design, change the press parameters to get rid of this issue. Uh, it could affect the disintegration. So if that cracking is actually cracking during disintegration testing, the data you're, you're, you're getting on disintegration is actually incorrect. It's because the tablet's actually cracking um, in the disintegration bath and you're getting incorrect data on those times. And that will impact the, uh, the solution profile as well. Uh, the friability, this, this could, uh, turn into a friability issue where, again, as you're tumbling these tablets and they, they fracture in the friabulator, that's going to cause a failed friability test. Uh, film coating is another thing to look at. So after you make your tablet and you want to film coat it, maybe for uh, modified release or maybe for tasting, but when you put your tablet in a coder, you're introducing heat. And the heat in this crack could actually cause capping in the coder, which is going to cause a film coating issue and quality issues. So that is my 30 minutes. So I, I want to thank everyone for your attendance. And again, I'm Robert Sedlock with Atoli Scientific. And we run a lot of uh, robustness uh, studies on brand new formulas or existing formulas. And we focus on the scalability challenges and these common issues. And I focus on tabletability and strain rate. And having this type of technology is very valuable because it gave us some early insight on a potential problem downstream that might not occur until after the whole development scale up process. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone for your attendance and I appreciate Ragaku uh, uh, for working with us and we look forward to uh, future collaboration. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation and see if I have any, any notes here or any questions. Uh, you can contact me at Natoli Engineering. Just go to www.natoli.com and then you can reach me through there.